Welcome back to Nightwatch. Even as a young lad, Patrick Mackay was in and out of psychiatric wards. He was obsessed with Nazis, torturing animals and building Frankenstein models only to burn out their eyes. But despite those early telltale signs, Mackay was wrongly diagnosed by doctors who released him from a secure psychiatric unit. The 20-year-old was soon to become a serial killer. Nick Jones has the story. London, in the 1970s, and a petty thief is turning into a killer. We are talking about somebody moving from the level of a criminal, which is what he was as a mugger and a burglar, into, the, into, the, into a serial killer, which is a, a, a very weird and extraordinary state for a human being to be in. He may have killed 11 people. His name was Patrick Mackay. He became known simply as the psychopath. Patrick Mackay may have been one of Britain's most serious serial killers. In early 1974, the map in the police incident room at Scotland Yard was clustered with red dots, pinpointing areas in southwest London where a mugger had struck, repeatedly targeting old ladies. On the 26th of February 1974, police discovered the body of an elderly lady, Isabella Griffith, murdered in her flat at Cheney Walk in Chelsea. She had been lying dead in her kitchen for 12 days. It was a bizarre and depraved murder. He forced open the front door and strangled her. He then placed the body in the kitchen, covered it up, closed her eyes. She was probably already dead, but he stabbed her through the chest, pinning the body to the floor. He then hung about in the house for a very long time, listening to the radio. At this stage, police did not realize there was a serial killer on the loose. His name was Patrick Mackay, and the warning signs had been there from his earliest days. From an early age, he tortured animals, uh, birds. He threw the alive tortoise of the families onto a bonfire. He terrified other school children. He terrorized his family. Even police officers, uh, he had a go at. On one occasion, he kicked his sisters and his mother out into the street and uh, it wasn't until the police arrived that they could uh, gain re-entry to the premises. And I believe at this time he was only about 12, 13 years of age. The older he got, the more out of control he got and the more his behaviour deteriorated. He could change very quickly if he felt, if he felt he was being provoked in any way. Sometimes even if he wasn't, nevertheless he would react in an extreme way. This is all a part of, you know, psychopathic disorder, I'm afraid. On the 10th of March, 1975, almost a year on from the murder of Isabella Griffiths, the body of Adele Price, another elderly lady, is discovered in a flat on Lowndes Square in Knightsbridge. Again, there are disturbing details to this murder. He forced his way in. He strangled her. But again, he, he showed a very, very strange behaviour pattern by staying in the place for about a, for several hours and indeed falling asleep in an armchair for hours with the dead body lying in the kitchen. Killing clearly fulfilled some psychological need in him. Police suspected that the same man may have murdered Isabella Griffiths. The hunt was on for a serial killer. Police were desperate to catch him before he killed again, as they feared he would. In the sleepy village of Shaw near Gravesend, Father Crean had been preparing for the busy Easter services. He was a well-known member of the community and held a strong commitment to helping the dispossessed. Unfortunately for Father Crean, he had a run-in with one of those to whom he had extended a helping hand, Patrick Mackay. The two had met whilst out walking. Uh, they became friends, and on one occasion, Patrick Mackay went back to the priest's house, he stole a cheque, forged it in the sum of £80 and obtained cash over the counter of a local bank. Uh, he later appeared in court. He was ordered to pay the father £80. As far as I'm aware, this £80 was never repaid and this led to the fatal incident on the 21st of March 1975. Less than two weeks after the murder of Adele Price, 
Detective Chief Inspector Lou Hart received a call he would never forget. My wife and uh, some friends and I had been out to a dinner and dance at Gravesend. Uh, and when we returned home uh, for coffee, uh, at about uh, one o'clock in the morning, the phone was ringing uh, as I came in the door. And I picked up the phone and was told about the murder. Uh, and that was no sleep for 48 hours after that. On the night of Friday the 21st of March, 1975, a nun, concerned about her local priest, made an horrific discovery. Submerged in his bath at home lay the battered body of Father Crean. Once again, the circumstances of the murder shocked even hardened police officers. I've been to several gory scenes before, but I, I've never seen so many injuries on uh, a murdered person before this. He had uh, multiple stab wounds to his neck and to his head. The skull had actually been broken open uh, with an axe as a result of multiple blows to the head. Even at the very early stages of this investigation, a trail of clues led to one man. Patrick had left his uh, name and address at the local railway station when he wanted to get back to London. He'd also knocked at a house um, coming away from the uh, scene of the murder. Uh, he felt dry and asked for a glass of water, which was given to him. And I also believe that he spoke to a local police officer as well who happened to be in the area, so he was well and truly uh, identified in the locality. It didn't need the world's greatest detective to put two and two together uh, and put Mackay into the frame immediately. Lou Hart assigned two officers, Mick Whitlock and Bob Brown, to hunt down Patrick Mackay. They were engaged in a desperate race against time to stop Mackay killing again. They had just one lead. Mackay was known to be staying on and off with another priest in London. In the early hours of this Saturday, uh, we were making telephone inquiries uh, in the London area, waking priests up. We eventually obtained a telephone number about 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, tried to ring the priest concerned, but there was no answer. Now this caused us to think possibly that this priest may have come to some harm. The two officers raced to London to find the priest in Finchley alive and well. He directed them to a hostel where Mackay often slept on the Great North Road. They were to get there at a crucial moment. The manager of the hostel was talking to someone on the payphone in the hallway of the house. He kept saying Patrick, so we assumed this was probably Patrick Mackay checking to see if the police had been there. This gave us a dilemma in that should we grab the phone and try and talk Patrick Mackay into giving himself up or do nothing in the hope that he will go back to the address and he will be arrested there. Uh, we chose the latter, uh, so therefore Patrick Mackay, once he put the phone down, didn't suspect the police had arrived. On searching Mackay's room at the hostel, the two policemen made some alarming discoveries. There were a number of Nazi symbols uh, on the wall of his room, swastikas, German uh, wartime expressions, uh, and various pictures of, of uh, Nazi uniforms. Under the cushion of a chair, we found jewellery, uh, fountain pens, silver pencils, uh, valued about £1,500, which we now know came from offences he committed in and around Chelsea and Belgravia. Residents at the hostel told the two officers that Mackay often stayed with a family named Cowdery somewhere in South London. It would take them another 24 hours to track down the right family. Meanwhile, Mackay was still at large, free to commit another crime. On Saturday night, the day after he killed Father Crean, Patrick Mackay targeted a retired nurse walking alone and followed her back to her flat. He forced his way in. There was a knife on the table. Now, if she'd said the wrong thing, he'd have done her. So, in fact, that would have been two people on two consecutive days, Father Crean on one day and this retired nurse on the other. Fortunately for her, Mackay was only interested in robbery. This time, he left his victim alive. The next morning, officers Mick Whitlock and Bob Brown visited a Cowdery family on Grantham Road in Stockwell. As luck would have it, Patrick Mackay was at the first address we went to at Grantham Road at Stockwell. He seemed to me to be extremely placid and compliant. He was in fact suffering from a severe hangover. The previous afternoon and evening, 
he had been committed offences in the Chelsea area gang and obtained about £35 in cash. This cash he had spent totally on alcoholic liquor. A tired and hungover Mackay was taken to Tooting Police Station for questioning and charged with the murder of Father Crean. I'll put it directly to him that he murdered Father Crean. He said, yes I did, I thought you would get me. He said, a white mist, a white cloud came down in front of me and I did it. We then took Patrick Mackay to Gravesend Police Station. En route, he took us to a, a garage near to Clapham where he said he had thrown a knife that he had used in the offence. In just 48 hours, Patrick Mackay had travelled a considerable distance from the scene of his last murder. The police had only just managed to catch their killer. We were lucky. Uh, we were very lucky in finding Patrick Mackay so early. He would have carried on to kill other people. It fell to Detective Chief Inspector Lou Hart to conduct a chilling interview with Patrick Mackay. It was an interview that I shall never forget. I've never had an interview like that before and never since. He said, I got the urge to do it. I felt like taking his head off. And then he described how he traced Father Crean into the bathroom, knocked Father Crean into the bath, and he described vividly how he got the knife and he said, I stuck, and I stuck, and I stuck. And that's exactly how he was telling it to me. He was actually reliving it, as he told us. And blood made him more excited and even more excited. I felt as though I was actually sitting on the edge of my chair and that he was actually going to fly off at one of us at any moment. Even though at this stage, Father Crean was probably dead, Mackay could not stop his physical assault. He picked up the axe uh, and attacked Father Crean, hitting him on the head with the axe many times. He put a cloth over Father Crean's head uh, because the brain was exposed by this time. And then he stood in the bathroom for an hour watching Father Crean. Uh, and he asked me, had I ever seen a body floating in water? Isn't it strange the way that they float up and then down, and, and then up to the surface, and down again. He said, I was fascinated by that. And uh, he actually said that he stayed there for about an hour watching this. Now, it was very apparent that he was completely mentally unbalanced. Robin Clark was called on to represent Mackay, and to this very day, images of the murder scene still shock him. I found with my papers, which uh, I had at the time, photographs which were taken of the interior of the building at Sean, where unfortunately Father Green lost his life. One knew that there had been a violent struggle and obviously Father Green had put up uh, a fight for his own life. I didn't want to go too far in because uh, the photographs get a bit horrific then. Right? Uh, not nice, not nice photographs. A truly gruesome murder, obviously enjoyed by Mackay. But how could someone so dangerous be allowed out of a secure mental hospital? We'll be finding out next. And we'll be meeting the policeman who still lives in fear of his life if Mackay is ever released. Join me in a few moments. Welcome back to Night Watch. The police were lucky in finding serial killer Patrick Mackay before he could strike again, but there were many questions to be asked about how and why the psychopath slipped through the medical and social services net. It's believed Mackay killed 11 people, and one man reckons he could still be his next victim if the killer is ever released. On Friday the 21st of November 1975, Patrick Mackay stood trial at court number two at the Old Bailey charged with the murder of three people. Given the violent nature of the murders committed, a long, protracted trial was expected. The trial only lasted 20 minutes. The trial was interesting, but a bit frustrating in hindsight. I used two independent um, psychiatrists, and they both agreed that um, Patrick was suffering from a severe psychiatric um, disorder, personality disorder and that he was effectively a psychopath. 
the trial judge only took about 20 minutes to accept the medical reports which were before him. Patrick pleaded guilty to three counts of murder on the grounds of diminished responsibility, um, for which he received three life sentences. Despite his obvious mental instability, Mackay was destined to spend these life sentences in an ordinary jail. No secure mental hospital, and in particular Broadmoor, would have him. Most psychiatrists accept that there is virtually no treatment for a psychopath. Uh, all you can really do is try and detect this, this personality disorder, which is what it is, at an early age, and put this person out of harm's way. And most, psych most psychopaths uh, end up in prison rather than, than receiving mental treatment. In the run-up to the trial, Robin Clark, Patrick's solicitor, encouraged his client to compile a memoir. Many hoped these memoirs would shed light on his depraved crimes and provide an insight as to how the young and very disturbed Mackay slipped through the net. He wrote some 40-odd pages, which I've got in front of me now, starting from his early childhood and then going on to the problems he had with his father. Mackay claimed he was the subject of violent physical abuse at the hands of his father from an early age. I think when he'd had a lot to drink, um, Patrick writes, the memories of the war came back to him, that's his father, very strongly and made him a very violent man towards me and my mother. Harold Mackay was, was violently drunk most weekends and was violent towards his wife in, the, in his son's presence and was violent towards his son Patrick. Patrick presumably learned, observing his father, to reach for violence as a solution to any situation which he couldn't handle in any other way. Ironically, it was the death of his father in 1962 that set Patrick off on a downward spiral. Patrick Mackay being fatherless was a fairly germane part of his problem. He himself, in, in, his, in his rambling memoir, said that his life began to go to pieces in 1962, which was the year that his father died. Mackay's behaviour became violent and unpredictable. He stole from other families in the neighbourhood, and at the age of 13, he was institutionalised for trying to set fire to a Catholic church. The young Patrick was admitted to a psychiatric unit at Beach House. It was run by Dr George Tull. He was um, referred to me as a behaviour problem, essentially. He wasn't able to uh, tolerate frustration. He exploded and uh, had very little sense of his own uh, ideas and his own motivation. Uh, he wasn't in charge of himself, really. Increasingly out of control, it was finally decided to send Patrick to Moss Side Hospital near Liverpool, a secure institution for mentally ill young offenders. By now, Gravesend's social services were at a loss with what to do with him. Patrick was in a, an appropriate the security institution receiving the only sort of care you can give an aggressive psychopath, and that is enclosure limits, you know, because they're not susceptible to, as I say, guidance in the community. But Patrick had a unique ability to turn on the charm at tribunals reviewing his behaviour. Despite the dangers inherent in him being at large in the community, he was discharged from Mosside on two occasions. On these two occasions, he shouldn't have been discharged, in my view, by the tribunal, because it just left, led to more unhappiness on his part and, indeed, on the part of his parents, or his parent and sisters. This chap used to go in and out of hospitals and um, lie low for a time, and then he emerged eventually and commit more crimes. He worked the system completely. As early as 1968, when Mackay was only 15 years old, Leonard Carr, a home office psychiatrist, wrote that Patrick would evolve into a cold, psychopathic killer. Yet Patrick was able to continue evading the system into the early 1970s. The system lamentably failed to protect society from this murderous man, in spite of the fact that several doctors, lawyers, policemen and other advisers, had worked out the kind of person that he was. Patrick started spending time in London, roaming the streets, drinking whiskey and taking speed. It was at this period in Patrick's life that Gravesend social worker Jimmy Rabette had the task of compiling six monthly reports for the Home Office monitoring Patrick's behaviour. As the 
months went on through 72 into 73, um, frequently I wouldn't know where he was. He wasn't at home and he was not uh, in, in the Gravesend area. He became a, a more accomplished burglar uh, and mugger. He just got money, which he usually spent on drink. Actually, hard liquor, whiskey, a lot of the time. While Patrick was evading his social worker, he was developing into a serial killer. I can't believe that, that I had the best part of a year and a half um, of working, supporting, um, monitoring uh, a serial killer. Police believe that in the early 1970s, Mackay went on a killing spree and, as well as the three murders he was convicted of, it is thought he may have killed another eight. We think that he, in fact, committed 11 murders altogether. We can't say for certain, for example, that he was one of the great serial killers who killed 11 people, though obviously you talk to policemen in private, there's not much doubt in their minds. Patrick Mackay has been serving a life sentence for the last 27 years. He is approaching his 50th birthday, and some feel that the time may have come for him to be released. Psychopathic personalities tend to mellow to some extent uh, when they reach the um, age of 45 or 50. He could be considered for discharge with proper supervisory arrangements that were indisputably containing and so on. You'll live here, you'll report here, if you don't do those things you go back. I'd like to think that with the, the years I mean, that he's been incarcerated, that his, the demons in his head or the, the angers and the frustrations of his childhood have been addressed in some way. But is the world ready for Mackay to re-emerge? Those dark urges that made him murder people he didn't know and behave in a macabre, bizarre, weird fashion around the body of the people he'd murdered. Who could be sure that they have completely gone, however old he is? And bear in mind that Mackay suffers the unfortunate background of having been released too early, over and over and over again, when he was young. And therefore there would presumably be some hesitancy about the risk of releasing him too early even if he's now middle-aged or, or older. Detective Chief Inspector Lou Hart looked deep into Mackay's eyes during one haunting and memorable interview. He believes Mackay should never be released. I have made a, a, an entry, caused an entry to be made on his file at New Scotland Yard uh, to inform me should he ever be released, because I need to know that. I have it on very good authority that he intends to kill me. Well, a chilling end to this edition of Nightwatch. It does seem amazing, doesn't it, that he was ever allowed out on the streets, especially when a Home Office psychiatrist had predicted when Mackay was a teenager that he would end up a serial killer. That's all from me and the team. Please do join us again. Good night.